Hello, everyone. Welcome to IEEE CEDA Distinguished Lecture Webinar Series. Uh, first of all, let me quickly introduce the IEEE CEDA Distinguished Lecture Program. It aims to promote the field of electronic design automation to the scientific community and the public um, at large. And the goal of the program is to increase awareness about topics relevant to CEDA by creating a pool of and subject matter experts and the scholars to present to IEEE and the CEDA chapters, sections, and other venues, including universities and the companies. So in the past two years and during pandemic situations, and we like to continue to serve CEDA participants and the EDA community. And therefore we created this virtual DL webinar series. Um, so for the uh, class 2022 and 2023, uh, we have um, five distinguished lectures. And today I'm very happy to have um, Professor Anupen um, Chattopardia, <laughs> Professor Anupen Chattopardia to present EDA for Emerging Technology. Anupen received his PhD from RWTH Arching in 2008. Afterwards, and he worked at a, uh, as a member of the consulting staff and, uh, in Coware R&D in India. Uh, in 2010, um, he joined RWTH Arch in Germany as a junior professor and the leading MPSOC architecture research group. Um, and since September 2014, he was appointed as an assistant professor in NTU and then promoted to associate professor with the tenure in 2019. Um, he received many awards, including Boucher's plaque from RWTH Arch in Germany for outstanding doctoral dissertation. Um, and um, he also was nominated for the Best IP Award in DATE Conference 2016, nomination for the Best Paper Award in the International Conference on VSI Design 2018 and 2020. He's also a fellow of uh, Intercontinental Academia and a senior member of IEEE and ACM. Um, Anupen, uh, welcome. So now the show is yours. Thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen. So is it visible to everyone? Yes, perfectly. Okay, okay, okay. So thank you, Helen, for inviting me and introducing me to this talk. And of course, thank you to IEEE Council of EDA for conferring me this uh, distinction of being a distinguished lecturer. I upfront, I should say, I am not sure if I am. Uh, really distinguished to talk about this very broad and deep topic, but uh, I have been following the research and doing the, the some participation to the best of my capacity in this area. And I would be very, very happy to engage with you in discussing and sharing what I have learned so far and what future holds for us in this area. So, I'll start my talk on electronic design automation for emerging technologies. So at first, I would like to introduce a bit about what kind of research I have been doing in the past in our group. In a sense, whatever research that we do in systems or material science or mathematics, computer science related to engineering, we can try to put it into multiple quadrants that starts from something linked with algorithms. In the past, I did work on wireless receivers, cryptography. In recent times, I have been dealing uh, with a lot of very interesting research challenges in AI, bioinformatics, and whatever this kind of advancement that comes from the area of mathematics that eventually boils down to some technology mapping which could be in the earlier case with CMOS technologies. And in future, we see that there are new technologies like in memory computing and quantum computing, this come up. So this is the connection between the algorithm to the technology, which can also be uh, conceptualized as a push and pull between the advances in mathematics and applications and the advances in physics, or in some cases could be biology, uh, 
So this link between algorithm and technology is established by growth of various kinds of architectures as well. That could be heterogeneous system on chip, application specific processors, reconfigurable processors. And this whole story is running very smoothly because we have very efficient automation tools. So without having a powerful, robust and scalable automation flow, we would be just dreaming about having some uh, wireless receiver on your handheld device. So this link is very, very crucial. And sometimes it's overlooked because we just get to use the tools and they provide us a stable platform for decades. But once in a while, like we see right now, we need to take a step back and think whether we need new tools and new automation flows. So this is exactly what's happening today. And that's why it's very exciting times for the EDA community. So looking back to the research that I have been doing, one of the fundamental problems when we were working on course and reconfigurable architectures or dense computation, data-driven computation that we kept on facing is what we call as a data locality problem. So what is data locality? Let me go deep into one simple example that we were trying to create a course and reconfigurable architecture for performing matrix operations. So if you take a four cross four CGRA structure where all of these blocks are simple multiply and accumulate, and they are connected with the broadcast networks for input and output, then what we can see is if we can put in the data in a proper order and perform the computation locally with the local data storage, then within four cycles, we are able to complete the complete matrix multiplication for a four cross four matrix. Now, if you have been following the research on matrix multiplication, including some recent breakthroughs by AI guided matrix multiplication, then we know that the complexity of it lies in the order of cubic. So for an N cross N multiplication, it would be order of N cube. So how come we are suddenly able to do it in four cycles? It's so linear. So the computation complexity to some extent is absorbed because we have an N square dimension CGRA, and that is performing the computation and storage locally. So this data locality is a fundamental principle that people have been working on for generations of computer architectures. There are many different techniques that they try to move the data locally and address the bandwidth problem. This the bandwidth problem has become actually quite crucial in recent times when we are talking about a lot of data deluge in the context of neural network accelerators. So we have been working on those problems in the context of wireless receivers, because you get a lot of numerical linear algebra kernels in that uh, kind of applications. And uh, this was a study that we were doing almost a decade ago. And in that context, we did some very different kind of architectures, what we call as a layered architecture. So in the layered architecture, we were trying to promote the concept that you have an, a base layer where we are doing the computation. And then you have multiple layers above this, which could be communication layer, memory access layer. And this above layers, they are also externally programmable, which means that if someone is performing the computation in the bottom most layer, then the controller can make the buffers or registers in the communication layer, move the data around this, which would be like a very smart and controlled cache memory, if you like to think in that way. And once the data movement in this layer is taken care of properly, then as soon as the computation in the bottommost layer is over, then it's like they put the results up and they get the operands down. So in that way, we can go for maximal utilization of the computation layer, which is always the goal. We don't want this part to lie data starved. So we did this study in the basic CMOS technologies. And at that time, there was a upcoming idea of through silicon vias. We did some uh, toying around with through silicon vias in collaboration with uh, other research groups. But uh, what turned out is that it's not very 
space efficient and we were moving very little amount of data while taking a lot of real estate on the chip. But the idea remained that you can have data movement coordinated in such a nice way that it always keeps the computation unit busy. And if you can put it forth with more and more clever architectures, then it would be solving a lot of problems. And around at that time, we also got to know that, okay, it need not be solved only through the architecture side, but there are new technologies coming. And it was fascinating to follow the technology development at that time in 2008, nine, back to back several papers appeared from different research groups and from Hewlett Packard, which says, okay, we have a new memory that can do computation in the memory device itself. And that completely turned around the way we were perceiving the architecture. So we say, okay, it's in-memory computing. And we started working on that technology primarily as a simulation model because the large size crosswords and all these things were still under development. But the key concept stuck very deep that you can break away from the limits of von Neumann computing it need not be that you are storing something in the memory and performing the operations only the CPU. And you can do all the operations in the memory if you like. So it's just taking to the other extreme. And some conceptual prototypes started emerging. We did some simulation results to show this looks good. And that was also the time when we tried to push forth a bit with the technology uh, studies and in collaboration with a group in Aachen and Jelish, we looked whether it's possible to also do ternary in memory computing because their in memory storage was able to store beyond binary structures. So we did some prototype with the help of this group on a very simple structure that we have three devices in this crossbar and we could show that we are able to do ternary additions or even fuzzy logic computation with these multiple states. So in principle, this works that you can do in memory computing. But one question kept on harping back to us that, okay, we can do in memory computing, but is it bringing some fundamental benefit? So why we need this? Why the processing in memory? And that's a question that we kept on asking until I had a chance to visit a group in Israel, Professor Shahar Kavinsky's group in Technion in collaboration with them, I was looking into the theoretical underpinning of the whole uh, processing in memory concept. And we started defining some basic parameters following the old school models of computer architecture studies that, okay, there can be a component called operational complexity, which can be defined in terms of the basic gates. And this is something that we all know that if there is a full ladder, it can be defined in terms of a linear number of gates with a multiplication, a quadratic number of gates with high precision, then it grows. So basically we can plot the operation size in the x-axis and operation complexity in the y-axis. And this would be our basic principle of operation complexity. So if we go for extending such basic parameters, then there could be different parameters that we can identify in the domain of processing in memory. There is an operational complexity, which is basically an algorithmic parameter. There is a PIM cycle time, which is a technological parameter. So of course the processing in memory technologies are slow. This could be caught up in future, but right now it's slow compared to what we have in CMOS. Then how many memory arrays we are having? Like if you have multiple in-memory computing arrays, then you can parallelize some operations and the dimensions of each array, the number of rows and columns. So in this parameters are taken into account, then the number of parallel computations by latency of single operations is what we can tell is the throughput of processing in memory. So for a given operation, if the rows and mats are increasing, then the throughput increases. If the operation complexity increases or the cycle time increases, then the throughput decreases. So this is a simple model. Of course, you can take more details into account, which we have put in this uh, paper. If you like to read like the data locality, if we are moving the data between rows and columns, what would be the overhead for this? 
And this is something that we can already start plotting that if we have some parameters that are varying and some parameters that are fixed, then we can see the operational complexity. If it grows, then the throughput decreases. And the throughput also decreases for different variants. Like if we have 16K mats, then the throughput has a higher curve compared to 4K mats. So this is one of the parameters that we already get from the PIM. And then in contrast, if you look into the CPU performance, the assumption that we are making here is the memory bandwidth is the only bottleneck because CPU is something that we have kept on improving for many, many generations and it's absolutely fast. We have all the concepts of uh, pipelining and uh, parallelism that is taken into account when we are designing the CPU data path. So two parameters that stand to play a prominent role. One is the memory bandwidth, another is the data in outputs. Data in output is something that we have from the operational algorithm. Memory bandwidth is that is currently what we are trying to address. This is the major challenge that the CPU and memory, they may have low or high bandwidth. So the CPU performance can be characterized as throughput CPU bandwidth by data in and out, independent of the actual operation. So if you start plotting this, again, you get a throughput by operational complexity in a chart. And then if we start putting this two together, then what we see is something interesting. So as the operational complexity increases, of course, the throughput of the PIM decreases. But for low complexity operation, the throughput of the PIM could be very high. This is the part where it is the getting the, enjoying the fruits of having through to the computation locally. Whereas CPU suffers because this is a bandwidth problem. And this bandwidth you can keep on altering. And on that basis, you can move up or down the whole curve. So this can be explained intuitively in a very simple say, uh, saying that if we have a lot of data in the memory and we want to perform a very simple computation, we can do it in in memory. If we have a few data to move to the CPU and the computation is huge, we should better do it in CPU. So this trade-off can already be captured analytically. And this is something that people are now studying by putting CPUs and in-memory computing as accelerators together in a same SOC. So there is a definite advantage of having in-memory computing accelerator in an SOC. And this can be shown analytically. This we now set out to prove by having more experimental studies. And these are practically realizable because uh, there are already memory vendors that has logic layer. And this is a group from Georgia Tech that I have shown by using the logic layer of hybrid memory cube, you can gain some advantage. You get further advantage if you are using DRAMs and do bulk bitwise and or operations. It's not a, a very, say, involved logical operation that we would like to have, but bulk operation. Still, for certain applications, this proved to be advantageous. And of course, you can go all the way through to say, I'm doing analog in memory computing and I'm performing deep learning and all these operations, and then you have advantage. So these are already practically demonstrated and more such use cases are coming up. So this is the background I wanted to cover in order to set the stage is why we need in-memory computing. And this has some value to offer. And once this is established, then the next question or challenge that comes in is what is the flow that one must adopt to perform design automation for in-memory computing or processing in memory? So this is something that we have been working for a while. And there are multiple other groups that also pursued the same EDA challenges. So I will cover a few basic techniques that have been identified. So in brief, we start with the processing in memory technology. It can be realized in DRAM, HTT RAM, RE RAM, magnetic tunnel junctions. And all these technologies, they have showcased various universal set of Boolean functions, like Boolean majority together with uh, NOT operation, NAND operation, imply logic, NOR logic, 
and we know how this logic operations are realized onto this technologies there are uh, simulation models there are actual prototype examples from which you can get the typical performance numbers so this whole flow can be set up now when we look into this native functions they are not exactly our traditional cmos logic synthesis flows except for say nand and nor so in some technologies it was shown that you can perform majority or imply logic in a more compact representation in in memory computing so if this is doable that means we have to rethink the logic synthesis or technology mapping according to that and beyond logic synthesis when we are looking into technology mapping this becomes even more challenging because the memory is where we are performing the computation is not like our typical gates in the cmos structure where we put all of them back to back or in parallel but the gates are actually the points in the crossbar of the memory so we are performing operation in one particular cycle and the next cycle if we want in that particular point you are storing it so we are playing between the storage and computation in order to get maximum benefit so that had Uh, challenge the researchers to completely rethink the synthesis and technology mapping flows so what's happening is the start let's say even uh, with a basic complete basis set that begins with a high level specification much like the traditional synthesis flows then represent that in one of the intermediate forms that could be majority inverter graphs there are many other intermediate forms that have been proposed i will cover some of them there are of course and inverter graph like the traditional uh, abc like tools and then there is a technology mapping that is happening here so we of course borrow a lot of existing knowledge and tools that have been developed for classical logic synthesis or for asics or for fpgs and try to port it to the in memory compute technologies so here is one simple flow that we could establish if you are going for two different choices that one can perform the in memory computing with an area constraint or with a delay constraint so these are typical flows that we also do in classical logic synthesis this can be also done for in memory computing technologies in the area constraint flows one starts from an and inverter graph and then partitions according to lookup table checks if the mapping is feasible or not and if it is not feasible then you again update the k where k is the input parameter for the lookup table and keep on redoing this at the end this is telling whether an area constraint could be satisfied or not otherwise it needs to partition in multiple memory arrays because your memory arrays that are provided for the crossbar could have certain row and column dimensions we need to fit it within that structure so which is taken as an input constraint here alternatively you can take the width just for the delay optimization and take it as a block formation so intuitively this block formation helps us to parallelize as much operation as possible then we pack the blocks to words and schedule and do generate the instruction so this instruction is unlike your high level processor instruction these are instruction which are triggering the low level voltage controls in the crossbar inputs so there are some interesting snapshots that we have observed when we were going for logic synthesis and one such example that i wanted to share with you here is what we call as a technology aware logic synthesis so for a technology mapping of the end network onto the crossbar it is beneficial if we can pack as many operations as possible in one single row because ideally we can trigger multiple rows of the crossbar in parallel so if i want to pack multiple operations in one single row we want to have one single w input feeding the entire row as our row voltage and then multiple columns b1 b2 b3 b4 triggering the column voltages where s1 s2 s3 s4 are the data or state that we have in the local devices 
So if we want to create such a structure, then in the majority inverter graph, we have to ensure that we have multiple sharing across the same level. And this is exactly an optimization that we tried in majority refactoring, running Boolean partitioning, algebraic rewriting and optimized MIG to deliver clear benefit that we can share across one single level. And then we could get much more compact representation in the crossbar. There is a lot of work in the classical logic synthesis which are targeted for the FPGAs. So which is the typical LUT based logic synthesis. And we also borrowed from this concepts and what we call as a supergate aided logic synthesis or in short, we call it Said flow. In the supergate aided logic synthesis, we saw or the first observation was that the crossbar array can map circuit cuts described as lookup table directly. So if you have a two input lookup table like this, then it exactly follows a 101 crossbar mapping where you can just fit the rows here, then the columns here, and then you get back-to-back -back computation happening in rows and columns, which means that if we can start from a logic network that is not partitioned like an MIG or AIG, but rather partitioned into multiple lookup tables, then we can pick up the lookup tables and just start packing the lookup tables almost like a fixing multiple blocks or actually we reused some of the concepts from the bin packing into this whole crossbar structure. And what more, we don't need to restrict ourselves into two, two input lookup table. It could be a K input lookup table as we want to have. And that's why we call it like a super gate. So what we did is we started from an AIG structure and then we tried different LUT size. And these LUT structures are fitted together in multiple partitions. And then they started fitting into a crossbar, which is dimensionally constrained by the magic structure. So magic is one of the technologies that is developed in the Technion University that supports in-memory computing. So we could pack this LUTs 101 into magic crossbar. And when this packing basically covers the whole crossbar, we cannot fit it anymore. Then we say, okay, we definitely need to have another mat or another complete memory array. This cannot be fit here. So this is the uh, heuristic that we had in mind and kept developing. So one of the technology requirements for the magic crossbar is that they are not fitting arbitrary Boolean operation. They were fitting n input nors where n can be greater than two. And in order to fit this, we said, okay, if you have a, a sum of product form, then this can be actually converted in a nor of nors LUT structure. This can be done by having a nor one for this structure, the nor two for the second level structure, and finally a not. So this multi-level nor is a basic representation of the main term structure which could be fit very nicely into the magic crossbar where you have one level of NOR operations going along the row, another level of NOR operations going along the column, and finally one NOT operation that is giving the result here. So this back-to-back -back operations fit very nicely into the magic crossbar, and then we could generate exact firmware or low-level instructions for someone to run a given large Boolean functions onto a crossbar structure. So there are various benchmarks and various uh, structures that we have tried. We have elaborated these results and the source code is also available for uh, downloads if you want to try out and extend this concepts or just develop your own uh, in-memory computing platforms then you can see how the flow is working by giving different constraints, starting with the LUT graph generation using the ABC logic synthesis flow from Berkeley, then do the LUT placement, generate the instruction. You can simulate this and you can also verify that your generated instructions are correct by formally checking the end results, end instructions together with this uh, input uh, uh, LUT graph from the benchmark structures. 
So in short, the design automation for program in memory, it works like that you have an input function, then you have different standard academic and very robust logic synthesis flows, which can generate various structures. You can do technology mapping using a simpler magic flow, using SAID flow. There are crossbar constraint mapping flow, and there are mapping flows which takes other constraints and delay constraints, area constraints into account to generate your end instruction, which you can simulate in different forms. So this is where we stand now. This has been already considerable amount of work. And one of the big challenges that we see is now is to do a lot of prototyping where real in-memory computing accelerators are integrated into the system, but we need to develop the operating system or compiler flows that kind of borrows the analytical model that I explained earlier. We call that as a bitlet model. So from that bitlet model, one can make a decision given a particular operational kernel, whether we should run it on a CPU or on in-memory computing accelerator and do this basic partitioning. Same way now we are playing around with the CPU or GPU partitioning, porting some functions into a particular accelerator. In the same way, can we grow to develop a system and accordingly also get the support of tools? So basic tool flow is already there and it is robust and scalable. So this is about the first part of my talk. So I wanted to cover the in-memory computing architectures. This is still on the, I would say, classical physics in this technology. And uh, I see uh, questions here from Rishi or Nikhil. So maybe since it's the half of the talk, I would like to take up this question. So how do you account for parameterization? So this is a very nice question. So it's possible to actually develop a parameterized library for given technology and given dimensions. We did this for some linear algebra kernels and we don't need to resynthesize that from scratch. But if you give an arbitrary Boolean function, any general Boolean function, and you just want to see what would be its performance on a given technology, you can also run the full flow. So, okay, you can also reserve some of your questions if you want for the end of the webinar. And I will move to the next technology, which is also receiving a lot of news and press right now. A lot of researchers are spending efforts across the complete system stack is the quantum computing. We talk about quantum computing in very different contexts, very different uh, application scenarios. And I will try to give you a glimpse of that why you it is interesting for EDA and what we see for uh, EDA challenges in quantum computing. In first, in quantum architectures, we see a few major classes. There, there are universal quantum computers like IBM, IonQ, SciQuantum, Silicon Quantum Computing. They are trying to promote this. And uh, this universal quantum computers, they can run any quantum algorithm, this is akin to general purpose processor, and I will come shortly why they are relevant to security threats. The other perspective of the quantum computers is quantum annealing, where you can configure a given quantum computer to solve a particular hard optimization problem. So there has been a lot of debate whether they are actually achieving a quantum phenomenon, whether they are having a speed up or not, but regardless of that, they are growing in popularity and they have their own mapping and optimization challenges. But since this is a more broader class, I will focus and restrict myself to the problems of EDA related to universal quantum computers. Now, coming to the security, there has been a significant growth in quantum computing studies. Once it was shown by Peter Shore in, uh, in his uh, landmark work that you can have some quantum algorithms breaking crypto systems in polynomial time in contrast with exponential algorithms in classical computing. So that creates a clear separation, although we don't know whether it's provable or not. There are some other algorithms where quantum researchers claim that this 
gap between quantum and classical is established and provable. Although we don't know about that, but as of now, we also don't have any polynomial time algorithm that can break RSA or ECC crypto system. So this is definitely ringing an alarm among the whole security community. So which says that if you are having a large enough quantum computers, then you can break the public key or asymmetric key crypto systems in a matter of hours. So how large? We need few million qubits. The physical qubits that are needed are in the order of millions, which is still far from our current range. So some people say, okay, it's not really uh, practical as of now and we don't need to worry. But the security community would like to think otherwise. And I know because I am also participating in some of the security research. Why? Because they say right now, if you are encrypting some of your message using RSA or ECC, uh, very dedicated adversary and attacker can start collecting this message. If these are sensitive, if these are uh, high security classified documents, they would collect it now. And maybe in five to 10 years, when the quantum computers become that large, they will start breaking these messages. So that means we have to start porting now because we see the quantum computers in the horizon. And exactly for this reason, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, they have launched a, a standardization process to promote something called post-quantum cryptography, which is bringing new cryptographic algorithms to replace current public key crypto systems. And for this new cryptographic algorithms, so far, we don't have any polynomial time quantum algorithm. So this is where we are now. And there are a lot of organizations and industry which are pretty bullish about the scaling of quantum computing. In the same way, people started uh, following the Moore's law and they worked very hard and still working very hard to keep Moore's law alive. There are uh, groups that are saying, okay, we, have, we can have something like Nevin's law following Nevin who is leading the quantum computing efforts and then we can have doubling of the capacity of quantum computer measured in terms of the number of qubits or measured in terms of the number of quantum gates that you can stack one after another. And in this scenario, quantum computing will get very, very powerful with this exponential growth within few years. And this is something that also makes it a very exciting challenge for the EDA people because we need to understand the basic gates and basic principles of this logic and this technology, which is completely different from what we have started in the CMOS. So what's there in a quantum computer? We have some building blocks that's called qubit, which is uh, analogous to what we have a bit in a classical computer. In a qubit, you can have two level system that can go from electron up spin and down spin. This has been extended right now that you can have multi-level systems. And this can be in zero or one in a superposition form. And the superposition means we have uh, in a bracket notation, we have, they have a probability of the qubit to be in a state of zero and one until the point where we measure it and then they decohere to a particular state. So very similar to what we had seen in, I didn't see it, but I have read like in 1950s and 60s, people were battling for the technologies, which will become the dominant technology for classical computing. Similarly, many people are putting forth their own technologies with minimal change in the current manufacturing fabrication processes to achieve this quantum computing phenomenon. There are ion trap technologies, superconducting technologies, solid state technologies. So good side of this having multiple technologies that they are also offering a very competitive scenario by which they can get scalable quantum computing in a few years. But the downside of this from an EDA researcher is sometimes it can be overwhelming exactly what technology we need to follow because we get a lot of technology level constraints to take care of when we are 
uh, developing our design automation flow. But fortunately, when we work in the higher level of abstraction, you can abstract certain things away and it can be a very generic flow. So that can be achieved if you're looking into the quantum gates. So similar to the CMOS gates, we also have quantum gates, which operates on the qubits. So initially the qubits are in a particular state. Then we apply the gates as pulses to achieve a next or final state of the qubits. So there are many quantum gates which can be represented in a linear algebraic form with the complex uh, bits uh, inside this particular linear algebra formation. And right now, one of the prominent quantum gates is consists of the Clifford group, which is universal. It is shown that it can model any quantum algorithm if you are using this Clifford group as a basis set. And the advantage is that they have very efficient fault tolerant implementation on several quantum technologies. Now, one interesting thing that you can see from some of the gates is that they have their equivalent classical representation. For example, control not gate is something very similar to what we know as an XOR gate. Similarly, if you are looking into control control not gate, which is also known as a Toffoli gate, this is like if the first and second input, both of these are one, then the third input is XORed or inverted. So this small O plus is basically like an XOR kit. So at the output, what we see here is if I call these two input bits an A and B, then the output is A, B, XOR, C. So now if I initialize C as zero, then this output is basically an AND gate. So I can get an AND gate, I can get a XOR gate, and I also have definitely simple NOT gate. And if I have all these gates, then I can also map a lot of classical operation into this universal form using these gates. So what we also need to take care of in a quantum computing is that it needs to be robust. And that is one of the primary engineering challenges the quantum engineers they are facing when they're trying to scale it up. The quantum computing is extremely susceptible to errors in gate control, environmental decoherence, initialization measurement error, the qubit fidelity, the qubits they are leaky. So in order to battle this phenomenon, people look into quantum computing in a fault tolerant manner. They add quantum error correction codes and there are various error suppression techniques. So usually these are taken together by an integrated approach where there are concatenated codes or topological codes that are implemented in a fault tolerant way inside a quantum circuit. So given this challenge, one of the things that people have realized is we are correct now in a domain where we have a noisy quantum computers. So we call it a noisy intermediate scale quantum computing or NISC as suggested by John Preskill, one of the leading quantum computing researchers who suggested that right now you can realize 50 to 100 qubits because it takes time to scale it up. There are various challenges. It will not be easily accessible. But maybe this 50 to 100 qubits, even if we consider noise, is already good enough. So there might be some problems like quantum machine learning, financial portfolio optimizations, molecular dynamic simulation that are already solvable beyond the range of classical computers abilities with the current quantum computers. So which means that as an EDA researchers, it would be a very lucrative target for us if we can map this interesting applications that have known quantum algorithms using low depth quantum circuits because we cannot afford to have too many gates in a quantum computer. And if we can do the synthesis and mapping using less qubits, noisy qubits and following certain technological constraints. So this is exactly where the challenge for the EDA begins. We start from looking into the quantum computers. It's growing. It is offering limited capacity now, which might already be very good. So you need to map a very complex quantum algorithm into this small size. And of course, when it starts scaling, we will reap more and more benefits. So how does the design automation for quantum computing look like? So again, 
there are multiple levels and this can be structured in this way that we start from a quantum algorithm which can be described for its specific programming languages like q sharp or project q that can be translated using quantum compilation by multiple tool flows that are being developed that maps into a target platform like a quantum computer if you want to really run out a quantum computer or could be a quantum simulator as well so there are lots of academic and industrial researchers that are coming together in this pursuit and there are open source synthesis and technology mapping flows that are covering everything where we start from a high level description go for logic synthesis go for synthesis flow using specific circuits and map onto the quantum level using various different kinds of architectures so what is the logic synthesis flow for a quantum circuit it can start from a boolean logic that you have a truth table based representation there could be binary decision diagram representations and there are people who tried to optimize the synthesis in such a way that you have minimum ancilla ancilla is an extra qubit that we may want to use because in quantum technologies we are having a completely reversible structure whereas some of the boolean functions that we begin with may not be fully reversible so we need to augment with with additional qubits so you want to get a representation which is using as little qubits as possible and perhaps zero little extra qubits so this is the zero ancilla synthesis there are works for specific circuit optimizations because the logic synthesis flows may not be so well developed and we want to optimize a very specific circuit let's say we want to optimize the building blocks of shorts factorization which has modular exponentiation or which has addition multiplication so these are extremely interesting problems and people are looking into it right now so let's say i want to simply map on a parallel prefix adder into a quantum circuit how would i do that and if i am doing it manually am i able to reproduce the same result if i use a logic synthesis flow for quantum so this kind of research problems are being pursued right now then there are quantum circuits using a t depth one the t stands for the t gate in the clifford plus t group of operations and this t depth one is a very interesting objective because the t gates they consume a lot of technology footprint if you are mapping into the quantum devices so you want to minimize the number of t gates or the depth of t gates so there are some quantum circuits for which you can achieve the t depth of 1 by adding extra qubits but in that case the qubit count is not your objective so there are similar phenomenon that you can have between qubit count and t depth so you can have this trade offs so when we try to look into this kind of logic circuits problems for quantum then we also uncovered a very classical view of logic synthesis that for any logic synthesis flow you can look into in the structural perspective or a functional perspective so if your intermediate representation is and inverter graph or majority inverter graph then this is scalable on the other hand if you are using truth tables or binary decision diagram this is not scalable but the advantage of this is then you can really hit optimal mapping optimal logic synthesis so one of the basic approaches that we propose is we can have hybrid logic synthesis that mixes the structural and functional flows so you go with a big structural representation pick up the blocks of interest and then optimize it map it optimally using local functional logic synthesis then stitch it back into the big structural diagrams there are also lut based synthesis and also synthesis using zor inverter graph that has recently been shown to do very very good for quantum logic because the xor gates occur naturally in front of form of clifford gate in form of c0 or cc0 gates in the quantum technologies and there is a bunch of very exciting problems when we go for technology mapping for quantum circuits so if you look into the structure here then this lines basically represent the qubits and 
these are the quantum gates that we are applying onto the qubits as pulses. In this particular case, the first and the fourth qubit are being applied a control not operation. In the second phase, we are applying a control not gate between the second and third qubit and so on. Now in quantum technologies, when you are applying the gates among very far qubits, then it's not considered to be convenient. So we want the gates to be as local as possible. And this is a problem that is known as a nearest neighbor constraint, quantum circuit or quantum technology mapping. This problem is shown to be really hard. And there are some very naive and brute force mechanism that you add swap gates before or after every distant gate. Like in this case, you add a swap gate and you make the distant gates local. Then you do another set of swap gates to get them back to their original position and continue. But of course, that incurs a lot of overhead because you are adding a lot of swap gates. So if we want to remove this, then you can have a look ahead mechanism that can minimize the number of swap gates. There are very nice heuristics that people have developed. In this case, we are only thinking about the gates to be uh, linearly organized, but in reality, you can have the qubits in many different formations. So to think of the nearest neighbor constraint mapping on these various topologies, that's a really challenging problem, which could be solved with a depth optimal fashion if you're going for an ILP formulation, but that doesn't scale well. So there are other heuristic solutions for this problem, which are actually integrated in some of the open source tools that I mentioned earlier in the IBM Kiskit or the uh, stack flow from Waterloo. And there are similar flows that are being promoted by different companies. So this topology constraints can be taken care of in uh, 1D or 2D structures. And uh, if the nearest neighbor cannot be managed, then we simply start inserting the swap kits. So the other constraints that needs to be taken into account when we are doing a technology mapping is called fidelity of the qubits because it was shown that all qubits are not really equal. That was a very nice work in ASPLOS 2019 that some qubits can be leaking and we should prefer ideally the qubits that can be robust and continue the operation and maintain the state over a lot of gates operations. So this quality of the qubit is something that you can directly get by inquiring about the different quantum circuits that are being offered as a quantum on cloud. So many companies have put it online. So you can have an account and you can check with how the circuits are performing. You can get the quality of the qubits. So they are not all uniform, which means that you can have a complete technology mapping flow, starting from a given logic synthesized output of a quantum circuit, how the technology mapping goes down in order to take into account like the nearest neighbor compliance and the fidelity. So this is one flow that we proposed earlier. We call it Mukut. So this is a multi-constraint quantum technology mapping where we start from an input quantum circuit, which is simply arranged in this linear array of qubit formation. But in reality, we know the connectivity graph of a quantum computer can have a structure like this, which means that we have to go for multiple subflows inside this. The first is to extract the topology. So this subgraph can have a T topology or a grid topology if we are taking a four qubit formation. So here we have four qubits. We can arrange them in this different formation. Then once the topology is taken, we need to also figure out the qubit configuration, like the L1, does it map to A or L1 is mapping to B? So that depends on how well connected the L1 to the rest of the qubits. So of course we want the most frequently connected qubit to be in the location B, because then it would be the nearest neighbor to all other qubits. Then once we have the subgraph extraction and qubit configuration, a nearest neighbor compliant circuit generation can be performed. And as you can imagine, the swap insertion is different if we are following T topology or the grid topology. After this nearest neighbor compliance is done, then there could be a fidelity aware mapping 
that looks into various possible T topologies and their corresponding qubits. So we get to pick up the particular physical qubit quartet, which gives us the best fidelity over the complete operation. So we tried some of these operations and we see that your choices and your uh, configurations running through the entire heuristic can make significant difference in the in fidelity. So this is just a glimpse of the technology constants that we face after doing the logic synthesis of quantum. And there are a bunch of open problems still lurking ahead of us. So what I can summarize from this quantum computing and EDA challenges is that it's accessible. As academic researchers, we can get to use very simple quantum computers and the model for large scale quantum simulators, quantum computers are already available. It's shown to be theoretically advantageous and it's high time that we need to start working on the EDA flow so that when the scalable quantum computers are available, we should not be looking for mapping robustness of this. The challenge is, of course, to fix the errors, like to take into account all the technology constraints to minimize any kind of error that puts a barrier in realization of this quantum circuit, optimize aggressively for specific circuits, so instead of developing a fixed logic synthesis flow, one can look for specific synthesis flow that optimizes arithmetic circuits, for example, and address new technological constraints that can arise because there are many different technologies that are competing in order to get into uh, this quantum world. So we have not been uh, working on this alone. And I am very fortunate to have excellent collaborations and supports from uh, many different universities and industries across the world. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank again IEEE Council of EDA for giving me this forum to present our research. So this is to summarize, we have been working on in-memory computing flows and quantum computing flows. There are other interesting technologies like cryogenic computing that brings in new EDA challenges or digital microfluidics. So it's always an exciting time for an EDA researcher. And I think no particular more exciting than what we see right now in our generation. So I would be very happy to engage with you in different points that I covered in this talk now or later over email and so on. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anubim, for very inspiring talk. Uh, it's a cross in both in PIM, like memory and computing, and also quantum computing, both are very hot topics in normal days. Uh, they're at a different stage, um, I guess, and um, for everyone here, um, please and use the Q&A features and for questions. And, but, you know, um, during this gap, and let me ask a quick question. Um, when talking about the challenges and for quantum computing, you mentioned about the fixing arrows. And it seems that this is the biggest concern for quantum computing development in these days. Um, I wonder, like, is there any ways and from uh, design automation, uh, we can provide a certain solution, even not like a full set solution? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think we are able to approach in two different ways. Mm -hmm. The first is, that quantum error correcting codes, they are a fundamental building block to address these errors. And there are different error correcting codes that are being proposed. So one can definitely try to implement that in a very optimized manner on given quantum technologies. And once we are achieving a compact and optimized implementation of quantum error correcting code, then we are already helping them because it will be there in many, many places. And sometimes this quantum error correcting code are also interspersed because you are running a lot of circuits with in between the error correcting code happening. So there is a very interesting work that can be done where you are optimizing them jointly, that you're performing some operations followed by quantum error correction code. And again, this operation, that's one direction. And the other would be that when I mentioned this technology constraints, like the qubit fidelity, or the nearest number optimizations. So these are basic uh, hurdles in achieving robust quantum computing across all technologies. 
So that means when we are doing the technology mapping or logic synthesis, we need to take into account this kind of constraints more and more. That will definitely help the researchers. I see. Thanks a lot, yeah. Nupin. Uh, there are more questions in, um, in the Q&A session. Um, okay. I, th so, I think, yeah. Yeah, so maybe I start taking one by one from the question that is first, I see highest in the uh, wrongly and Fu. They said, you mentioned Toffoli and Fredkin gates which belong to reversible gates. And what is the relationship between quantum computing and reversible logic? So quantum computing, is achieved by using quantum gates. And quantum gates are basically reversible. So that's one of the basic principles of quantum gates. So Toffoli and Fredkin gates, they are mappable to classical Boolean circuits and Boolean logic. They are reversible logic and they are also realizable in quantum technologies. So there are of course other quantum gates for which you will not see a corresponding classical structure because they are only realizable with a uh, complex state that is not achievable classically. But they are also reversible in the quantum domain. So fundamentally, all the building blocks quantum computing are reversible and they are interseparable. So if you are doing a very nice reversible logic synthesis, then you are definitely also helping quantum computing. So then I have this question from Apurbu Kormakar. How can we find the source code? So you can just send me an email corresponding to anything that I discussed. I guess that this will be, uh, this uh, webinar will be put online. So you can go through this and you can point me to this particular place. Or alternatively, you can also look into my DBLP page. And if you find any particular paper for this source code, I will be very happy to provide this. All the source codes are publicly available. Okay, so I see a question from Ashish Pasaya. You're looking into dynamic power optimization strategies and at which level and possible free tools, any suggestion from you beginners like me? This is a very broad question. And I think uh, Helen is also very knowledgeable in low power computing because she is from the group which has been working on this for a long, long time with Koshikra's group and Purdue's group. So I'm not sure if it is exactly linked with this work and this is too broad a question. But if you send me an email, I will be more than happy to give you a few pointers. So there are many low power optimization techniques across the full system stack. This is always a challenging problem and uh, I will be happy to give you some pointers, but I am not answering it because it's not exactly linked with this. Okay, so in, I see a question from Vishu Nikhil. In traditional computing, do you limited resource analysis, you quickly develop many techniques to share. Is there any similar activity or is it too early for this? Uh, this is a very interesting question and it's already happening to some extent. So if you see the works very recently by some added designs from Craig Jitney, who is working in Google and he proposed one adder structure that suddenly reduced the qubit count just by half of all the previous quantum adders. And he did this by performing a local operation and then using the result over multiple layers of computing. So this is basically having a result locally being stored and reused over multiple steps and not continuously computing. So the same kind of operations that we conceptualize in classical started to appear in quantum. There are also other things, for example, people who are looking into quantum neural network, they are looking into how they can perform in a distributed manner because the quantum computers are yet not very big. So you may have 20, 30 qubit quantum computer at your disposal. So is it possible to do the training and inference in partition? So they are bringing out the previous concepts of distributed computing and distributed training into the quantum neural networks. So I am not sure if it has gone to the all details of virtual memories or protection domains, but the early stage of computing concepts already is appearing in quantum and it's benefiting definitely.
So if you have seen the evolution of classical computing, it would be very interesting, I guess, for you to come in and join now and see how you can contribute from that level of knowledge. <laughs> Thanks, Anupin. Thank you all for all the questions. It's been very broad and heated discussion. Well, uh, unfortunately, we ran out the time. Um, so uh, before we end this session, uh, I'll let you know this. And this presentation has been recorded that will be available on the CEDA website after the event. And so uh, if you wanted to learn more and wanted to review, uh, it will be on the CEDA website. And we're going to have a more distinguished lecture um, uh, coming in the coming month. Um, so particularly for Professor Chaturpadia, um, he actually offers multiple DL lectures on C uh, CEDA website. And so 